right, can I start it? <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. I want to welcome you to our January um, webinar for GAPQC for Optimizing Newborn Nutrition. Um, happy 2023. Hope everyone um, had a great new year. Today, we are going to be focusing on lactation risk assessment and the warm handoff. First, we're going to start with a few updates. We have um, some conferences that are upcoming. We wanted to share with you all the Georgia AAP Winter Symposium. Uh, will be held on Saturday, February 4th. Um, that is here in Atlanta, and um, it's in collaboration with the Georgia OBGYN Society. Um, part, there's a really great lineup of faculty who are speaking, um, including Dr. Taryn Fairley and uh, Deborah Taylor from our neonatal committee. Um, you'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Fairley today on our webinar. Um, so if you are interested in attending that symposium, um, we'll put the link for registration in the chat. It'll also be in the email that goes up um, out for follow up after the webinar. Also, Emory's um, 33rd annual conference on breastfeeding will be held March 13th to 14th at the Emory Conference Center. That does carry 10 and a half hours of CE for nurses, physicians, dietitians, lactation consultants, and uh, support providers. And we'll have more information to come on sponsored registrations from GAPQC for that. Registration did open today for the conference, and we'll make sure that that link is in the chat and um, sent in the follow-up email as well. And then finally, lots of meetings um, in this uh, future. GAPQC uh, has the annual conference April 13th through 14th, also at the Emory Conference Center, and we will be sending more information on registration to come as well. Um, the 13th is in person and virtual, so it's a hybrid, and the 14th is all virtual. Um, so lots of opportunities for attendance there. We'll also have some um, information on sponsored registrations for that um, that we will be sharing. Uh, this is more information on that winter symposium. We'll be sending this out, um, as I mentioned, with the registration link in the follow up email. And finally, um, Georgia Speak Up for Moms and Babies. We mentioned this a lot in the fall. There was an October training opportunity. Now there is a May training. It's the Speak Up Champion Implicit and Explicit Racial Bias Education. Um, that is May 11th and 18th, 830 to 1230. Um, I'll put this registration link and the code in the chat and the follow-up email. This is a uh, funded through a grant from the Healthcare Georgia Foundation, so it is free for you to participate. This is for folks who have not previously participated in a Speak Up Champion training. So if you have participated, please share this with folks on your team who may not have participated. Um, if you And if you have not, please register. Um, there are um, still registration spots available, so we'd love to see um, you all um, in that training. And um, that is all the updates. We'll have a few reminder dates um, at the end, but we wanted to get into our content of the webinar. So I want to hand it over to Dr. Fairley and Claire Eden um, for that part of our webinar. Okay, let me see if I can get my screen shared here. Window. Hopefully I'm opening. Okay, let's see. Okay. So our topic today is lactation risk assessment and the warm handoff. Dr. Fairley and I, you're probably tired of us, but we're we're the ones presenting to you today this information that um we really had particular ideas in mind, so we decided it'd be easier for us to present. Um, and we wanted to start out with, um, you know, kind of hearkening back to um, information that we know um, based on the Maternity Practice and Infant Nutrition and Care um, survey that's done by the CDC. Um, this provides um, information, uh, you know, from the hospitals that do participate um, in the survey. Um, 
it, in this, the 2020 report, which is what's available, um, 43 of 77 eligible hospitals participated. And if you were um, haven't heard Dr. Mark's talk from last year's um, annual GAP QC meeting, that recording is available on the GAP QC website. Um, but this tells us um, we can break down the subscore that um, of the hospitals who participated in the survey, which is probably those who have the most rosy information, um, about 33%, um, only 33% of hospitals participating in the survey had ideal response around few breastfeeding newborns receiving infant formula. Um, and we also know from the CDC breastfeeding report card that about 20, per, um, sorry, 80% of mothers in Georgia initiate breastfeeding. Um, and that's been steady for the past um, five years, five or six years or so. Um, uh, so of the 80% of mothers in Georgia that are initiating breastfeeding, uh, many of them are receiving um, infant formula supplementation while they are still admitted, their babies are receiving in, infant formula as a supplement while they're still in the hospital. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, one of them is that um, we have and that we're addressing here in our initiative is the knowledge base. Like we seem to think that it's a kind of we're not really sure how to tell who's going to who's going to be running into trouble or encounter lactation issues. So um, we have a kind of a, a low knowledge base around the physiology of lactation and what is normal infant um, weight recovery in the early days and weeks. And then, of course, you're all dealing with issues with staffing, um, uh, which are met multiple enough staff, trained staff, who should receive training around lactation support, when those folks are available to mothers. Um, and of course, this kind of assessment um, and care provide, uh, takes a lot of time to do it's it's time it's perceived as being time consuming and there's a lot that needs to happen in those few, first few days and then you know really one of the the most important factors on why we supplement so much are we've all you know had patients that got in really dangerous places with not eating enough and we don't want to harm first do no harm right patient safety is a really big um factor. And so sometimes it can be a sort of shotgun approach and we're going to just um, supplement anytime there's any hint of a problem um, rather than, you know, if we don't have enough time or enough staff or enough knowledge to make a more, um, a more um, precision decision about that. And then this is, of course, what we're looking to prevent. We don't want to have families turn around and get, re uh, you know, their babies being readmitted for poor feeding hypernatremia, jaundice, or things related to, um, you know, not getting enough to eat in the first um, few days. So a lot of times it can be sort of like we don't really know when, like we're guessing about when there might be a risk factors for um, lactation issues, but in reality we generally know who, we can make some level of prediction around who, um, who might encounter issues. And knowing these risk factors and combining that with an understanding, a more thorough understanding of lactation physiology can help you and your team and your unit do a better job of assessing, um, treating, and discharging um, your families more safely. So our objectives today, things you're going to um, hopefully feel more confident about leaving the webinar today is how to identify risk factors for insufficient milk supply in that early postpartum period, how to screen perinatally for these key risk factors, and then maybe most importantly is how to communicate among your team, how to hand off this information and to whom in order to discharge your patient safely. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Fairley. So like anything else, you kind of have to know how the process starts, how the milk gets made to kind of understand who might be at risk for these more severe outcomes early on with insufficient supply, which are the events we all want to prevent um, while still minimizing our supplementation use with formula. So 
in general, people are making milk by 16 to 22 weeks. That's considered lactogenesis one. It's not a lot of volume and it's not released from the breast because we've got progesterone on board from the placenta and estrogen as well. It's not depicted here. So there's some hormonal control there. And then at birth, with the release of the placenta, we drop our progesterone levels quite precipitously, as you can see here from the arrow. Um, all sorts of inhibition is released, and we have a nice spike in prolactin right after delivery as well. And that brings copious onset of milk production or lactogenesis to L2 here in the diagram. L2 and L1 are both um, endocrine or under hormonal control. Um, and then somewhere over the next three months post-delivery, um, after the milk arrives, after the milk gets made, thanks hormones, um, your body decides how much to keep um, through local or autocrine control. I'll give a little bit more info there. Next slide. I think one of the things that I get the most questions on from residents and from other physicians is, Really, people have milk from 16 to 20 weeks. Well, yes. And that's because we really started building this gland quite early prenatally. There's a kind of branching tree. You see the trees here in the breast. Um, these are, you have a really primitive structure like this and that's built in intrauterine life. And in fact, with the right kind of hormonal stimulation and full term infants, you'll actually proliferate some breast tissue. And I think it's something like 75 to 80% of term babies will have some breast buds that grow in response to mom's placental um, milieu. Um, after the, after those levels, you know, subside, they go away, thankfully. Um, until puberty, when that structure gets developed, the branching trees fill out, um, you get all the nice arborization in the ducts that hopefully at some point in pregnancy will be completed. So while this tree here that we can see does have its nice little branches fill out, we really don't fill out the lobes, we don't make the cells, we don't make the interface to make milk, we don't actually make the cells to make milk until that first um, trimester pregnancy. So while we start prenatally, we really don't finish and we really don't know what's there and what works until first trimester of first pregnancy. Next slide. So I always like to take this moment to re-emphasize something that I think is a bit of a misconception about supply. And I just like to take a minute and just discuss the fact that the milk truck arrives postnatally after delivery whether or not you do anything at all, and I think we've all had those terrible IUFD patients, patients with losses who are then, you know, kind of doubly hit with engorgement some number of days later. You can do absolutely nothing and have engorgement, and that's because L2, lactogenesis 2, is under hormonal control. The milk truck comes, whether or not you do anything at all. It may get better fill, you may have better volume in the milk truck if you do early stimulation. We certainly are all about early initiation of lactation for this, for this initiative in particular for our preemies. But the truck comes no matter what you do. Next slide. And this hormonal control that we're talking about is various things that you see here on the left. We have kind of a crude drawing of a placenta. It's a lot more complicated than that, doesn't it? And dropping out the progesterone here in the diagram helps you make prolactin, gets your milk synthesis going. Um, decreasing dopamine also helps get your prolactin production going. Adequate cortisol levels, adequate thyroid hormone levels, insulin growth hormone are also all required for milk synthesis. I usually use this graph to just kind of underscore that these are the things in control and that you do have to have a drop in progesterone, and that's important for people with things like routine products of conception that'll delay lactogenesis too. Um, and also to underscore that milk synthesis and secretion are in two different pathways, two different parts of the pituitary gland. And so that milk ejection reflex, that letdown reflex is mediated by oxytocin released from the posterior pituitary, and more about why that's important in a minute. Next slide. So we talk a lot about the milk trick arriving, whether or not you want it to, and a lot about the hormones involved in lactation, because when people think about supply issues, it's this slide and these kind of underpinnings that I think come up first and foremost. And it's important that we recognize that autocrine control is most of people's lactation time, right? Most of the time a diet is feeding 
they are under autocrine control. And so to set people up for success, this does need to be covered. So this autocrine or local control is purely regulated by removal. It is a use it or lose it situation once supply has come in, once the truck has arrived, right? And if you don't use it, you make this feedback inhibitor of lactation, this whey protein that signals to the lactocytes to downregulate production. There's still some hormonal effect, as you can see from the prolactin dropping, but over the three month period of time, actually your prolactin levels drop quite quite low. So. But again, the milk truck is self-driving. You have no control necessarily when it arrives to some degree, and it's going to arrive no matter what you do because of this hormonal control. Um, so in the early postpartum period, which is when I think this is what we're all talking about with respect to our patients, the endocrine is so much more important than endocrine, even as the weeks add on. And I usually say until about three to four weeks postpartum, there's still a lot of endocrine control that's going on and some in significant influence. So this feedback inhibitor of lactation doesn't really weigh in quite as much. So early supply issues like profound low supply, no milk, which is how we're going to characterize it here in this talk, or delayed lactogenesis too, so greater than seven days postpartum is how that's usually defined, or slow milk. They are not caused by failure to not breastfeed enough. Okay, and I say this because I think one of the other motivating things, um, or something that's often a concern for medical professionals, health professionals in general, is guilt associated with breastfeeding experience and making moms feel guilty or insufficient. And realistically, there are a lot of women who have some of these other causes of low supply that we're going to cover here in a minute that are made to, felt, made to feel like they just weren't doing enough to get their milk going. So when we lo look at low supply, we tend to break it down and the physicians in the audience will recognize this kind of thinking, kind of like we do with renal pathophysiology, we break down low supply into kind of three areas. Um, so we've got preglandular. So before the milk making gland, the mammary gland, where hormones block the stimulation of the gland to make or release milk. So people who have postpartum thyroiditis, um, although we usually note them a little bit later on, closer to the end of the first month of life. Um, PCOS, insulin resistance, GDM, we'll more about that in a minute. Um, and then oxy oxytocin reflex disruption from shock, systemic illness, surgical stress, moms who are hypovolemic from, you know, a big EBL our moms who need transfusions, things like that. Um, because with, with those kind of systemic stressors, you're not going to get the reflex working right as well. Seems like a poor design really in human history, considering how dangerous childbirth can be. Um, in terms of glandular causes, that's where there's just really not any gland there that's able to make milk. So these are people with um, insufficient glandular tissue, and we'll talk about that more in a moment or who have secondary breast hypoplasia, so they've had radiation or surgery, most notably breast reduction, and just don't have a lot of tissue there. Um, and then postglandular problems are the most common, but really are not the purview in terms of the early postpartum period of which we're speaking. Um, they are important. It's something I think everyone should recognize that there's poor trans there's transfer issues. Failure to remove milk means you get decreased supply, but again, that's later on in the lactation experience typically than when we are of which we're discussing, um, and then separation, early separation. Um, so just no opportunity. So not transferring because they're not there, or not transferring because they just aren't able to do so well. Next slide. Claire? Oh, are we to me already? OK. Um, Let's see, let me get back to, I'm like looking at two different screens at the same time. So who are some of um, folks that might be um, at risk of having um, delayed lactogenesis? Um, the, you know, we've kind of gotten an introduction here, but um, pain um, impairing letdown um, is going to be an important um, angle um, that reflex that um, Dr. Fairley was talking about. Um, and then uh, the, and related to that, and then insulin resistance, such as prediabetes, PCOS, um, DM2, and then particularly insulin dependent, gestational diabetes, um, these are, are pretty um, big risk factors for delayed lactogenesis. And there's more um, and more research kind of happening around this um, all, all the time. Um, 
It's just a webinar. Okay. Um, so uh, if you can double check if you're muted, that'll um, oh. help everyone be able to hear better. Um, so um, some of these delays um, are delayed. Some of these factors can delay milk supply and some of them can simply impair uh, milk ejection reflux. And so why do we want to have sort of a specifically focus on insulin resistance or, or how does insulin resistance um, uh, delay lactation? And um, part of this is the decreased prolactin response. Um, and part of it is related to the, um, the just how fast or how at what the timeline is for those shifts that we were looking at in the um, in the graphic that we use in a lot of our talks. It's so helpful to understand the progression and the physiology of lactation. Um, and then also um, a lot of um, the factors contributing to lact that shift um, and is that, you know, the drop in progesterone and then how the progesterone has been suppressing lactation and then how many receptor sites or the activity of those receptor sites for the prolactin. Um, so the prolactin receptor sites sort of like waking up and being able to um, receive the message that the baby's here and it's time to be making milk. So actually, as well, Claire, and I for, forgive me, this is my slide, and I should have jumped in yeah. when you grabbed it. Um, okay. So this decreased prolactin response is in response to breast stimulation, so pumping or feeding. They simply right. just don't bump the same way. So even, you know, diets who are making great efforts to feed and feeding well, it may still just not get them the same bang for the buck in terms of response, or it may just take longer to get up to a prolactin level that they need. And this delayed decrease in estrogen, this is brand new stuff. And I actually found this this morning. So. In general, just estrogen levels, like when you withdraw the placenta, right, you drop estrogen and progesterone. And in general, thought to be because of ex excess adipose tissue. Um, but even in relatively lower BMIs, they found that the estrogen level just tended to drop a little bit more slowly. So it just slows everything down in terms of production. And then we have so many more receptor sites and the lactocytes um, than we really can utilize and kind of gig the machinery. So this is actually specific for insulin, which you do need to make milk. You guys saw that on the flowchart that we had before. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many more receptor sites, and so you don't get enough of them occupied. And in general, this just mainly slows down synthesis. And in my studies, they actually see full engorgement in day of life, 17 to 18. So this is why we're talking about this. People are like, meh, I see people with gestational diabetes all the time. They seem to do okay in the hospital with breastfeeding. As an outpatient breastfeeding medicine and pediatric provider, let me tell you that they come in with really starved little chickens and nobody wants that. Um, and that's because it can take a good bit longer than a baby is able to wait. Right. So the idea, if I'm hearing you correctly, then is that the prolactin response is somewhat muted, right? So I mean, on the on the graphic, it shows prolactin is high after birth, but really it also even is jumping when a baby is feeding or when you're pumping or hand expressing. So that that jump is being muted with the insulin resistance. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Um so these are risk factors for um, really having um, very little milk production at all. And um, one of the main um, kind of tip offs is um, women who have really no breast changes at all during pregnancy. Um, you know, generally we're going to see in the first trimester that they have fullness, their nipples or breasts feel sore or tender. Um, that they um, may notice veining, um, either, you know, raised veins or in light skinned women, you'll see blue, lots of, you know, increased vascularity. Um, and then just general size, having to buy new bras is like a little shortcut, right? Um, to ask. Some people will say they didn't really notice breast changes, but if you go through those specifics, um, not having any of these type of not having noticeable glandular changes in pregnancy is a pretty big um, red flag for um, really having very little milk production. And then history of breast surgery, injury, 
biopsy, lumpectomies, reduction. Um, so both reduction and augmentation can be meaningful. Um, you know, breast reduction is basically taking, you know, removing portions of a functioning organ that has been is sort of sleeping at the moment. It's not active, um, but when you take out large sections of that, it can interrupt um, vascularization and um, nerve network in the in the organ. So um, a history of breast reduction um, can really affect milk production, and some of the nerve issues can also affect even if the breasts are filling um, and had changes during pregnancy, it can interfere with milk being able to exit the breast. Um, and then um, augmentation is often a red flag because um, oftentimes that's done because of concern for like um, asymmetry or um, lack of gland, the kind of the appearance of the, the glandular development is what um, a lot of folks are trying to replicate with a breast augmentation. So um, these are important to note. Um, in terms of risk factor for really no, very little milk production. Claire, before we change, yes. I just want to underscore two, you know, two little things. In terms of, of glandular changes, some people will say that they had some darkening of the areolas, and, and that's really without other breast changes associated with it. That's still a huge red flag. People are often concerned about this question and some of the anxieties it can unmask. But in general, after 18 years of lactation, I'll tell you that when I ask this question carefully and keep on asking things, people typically look at me and say, yes, and I worried about that. I was looking up stuff. I don't know if they work. And a lot of times they will have told 10 different providers before they get someone who says anything other than just breastfeed as much as you can and see a lactation consultant in the hospital. And that is a huge disservice for patients. We can do better than that, um, than sending them scurrying to the internet for something that I think we all should know about. Um, in terms of history of breast surgery, lumpectomy and biopsy, and I'm being quite specific, they can cause problems, just like Claire said, you cut a duct, you cut a nerve, um, happens sometimes too with augmentation, depending on habitus. Sometimes they'll cut that fourth intercostal nerve, which is what's uh, what uh, allows for ejection. But you also have to think about parity, and I, I we talk about parity all the way through this talk because it really, really matters. And so, you know, if that first trimester of your first pregnancy, you're making the gland that's going to make the milk, a reduction after lactation after you know a few pregnancies is a very different situation than a primat who reduced prior to pregnancy. And so while reduction is always a red flag and should always be handled as we're gonna discuss in a little bit, not everybody has a profound low supply with breast reduction, particularly after having a lactation experience. And augmentation, I will just say, point of order, everybody has pictures on their phone of everything now and typically, <laughs> Very typically, people will have a picture of pre and post augmentation, um, and they're very willing to show you in my experience. Yeah. And reduction, I mean, there's some at least anecdotal evidence that the longer, the more time that's passed since breast reduction, perhaps the more likelihood of more milk being able to be making its way, may, being made and making its way out. Um, we did want to touch about in, on insufficient glandular tissue and encourage your team to talk about what, how are you assessing, how are you talking to parents about this, who's involved in, you know, who's looking at anyone's breasts, um, and, you know, how to kind of tread carefully around documenting um, this, who's asking the questions, and because assessing whether or not um, a mother experienced any breast changes during pregnancy is critical, but it's often asked like in a prenatal experience and not kind of carried over through. Um, and, and, and we want to encourage your, your group to discuss, you know, how are you passing this information that's critical to triaging lactation care and to making a feeding, a safe feeding plan. Um, you know, the, in terms of IGT history, you know, the, is perhaps more important than the, the physical exam. And um, it's okay to be, say, like, let's see how it goes and encourage folks to breastfeed and, and make sure that you're connecting them with 
extra support. This can be a factor in terms of like triaging your IBCLC care, which as we've heard in other webinars is, you know, limited in most hospitals um, and not making a prediction. Claire, can we go back and actually take a look at the pictures yeah. a little bit? I mm -hmm. think this is probably a lot of the first time that a lot of this group has ever seen these. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are kind of the stigmata for IGT. Um, and But in general, um, this applies best to, with, with the exception of type 4, which is obviously pretty profound hypoplasia or lack of gland development, less of mm -hmm. lack of breast development. It's It can be quite hard to tell, especially with multiples. Um, just by exam, but you know, things like a narrow flat base, a high fold, widely spaced breast, a lot of asymmetry is concerning. But you'll notice here is that this little or no growth during pregnancy, a little or no engorgement. Next slide. That's really the best predictor. History, I mean, 98% of diagnoses, right? That's what they tell us in med school. 98% of diagnoses are really truly established by history, not necessarily the labs you get or the exam you do. And you want to be very cautious by assuming in assuming that anything that you're seeing on exam is the whole story there. The proof is in the tissue. And so with PrimeFs, we really, really, really don't know until they go through the entire cycle of lactation if what they're going to make. I've had people with really profound IGT make like 40% of a supply and folks with just a little asymmetry who made 20 mLs all day long after eight pumping sessions, high quality removal and they make very, very little. So you really have to see what they're going to deliver after delivery. Um, and and yeah. that's why it's important not to prognosticate like, well, you, I don't know that you're going to make milk. We never say that. We say, I think your, your milk might be a little slower to arrive is what I usually take pe tell people, or there may be a little bit more risk for some trouble. We're going to make sure that you get some help. In general, these, these people know and are already concerned about it and are glad that you recognize something that's been worrying them probably for nine months. Mm -hmm. Or longer. And it it also connects to that issue around like whether you can or can't breastfeed. I mean, ex can or can't exclusively breastfeed is a really different issue than whether you can enjoy a lot of the benefits and experience of breastfeeding, um, both both the mother and the baby. And it doesn't, you know, it we don't want to imply that there's it's an all or nothing situation before people even have a chance to get started. Um, so screening for the risk of, you know, very suppressed milk supply, um, there's a couple different opportunities to do this. Of course, um, you know, it's often done prenatally during, you know, a standard um, well check um, for folks who are receiving, you know, high quality and consistent prenatal care. Um, this is part of that process. Um, there's some really good opportunities that I think lots of folks are probably missing on admission to labor and delivery, um, especially if it's not like the baby's coming out right now, that these are some good um, questions that can be done on admission. Um, and then, you know, when when we're moving from um, labor and delivery to mother baby, um, that that's a really good opportunity for handoff of this information. And then of course, particularly um, for NICU admissions, um, especially for very preterm infants or other babies that may be at high risk of necrotizing enterocolitis, it's really important to be asking these questions and then communicating. And um, I took a communication class in college and I'll never forget like, just having that aha moment of communication is very basic, but communication only happens if somebody is both sending the message and somebody is receiving the message. So thinking through on your team how this information can be assessed for and how it can be communicated in between, and that's going to look a little different um, in different hospitals. So um, in that pre-delivery kind of um, opportunity, Really, we should be asking all patients about breast changes during pregnancy and any relevant medical history around breast surgery, injury, or biopsy. And then for multips, asking about their previous lactation experience. Um, you know, did they experience breast changes? Did their milk come in after delivery and how soon um, it happened? And, and some folks might need a little bit more pressing, you know, more question probing questions around 
whether they'll, their milk came in. I mean, if they say they don't know, but then, you know, they breast, if we're exclusively breastfeeding a baby who's growing well, then yes, it did. But they, not everyone experiences like massive engorgement, but a lot of folks do. And they have, and they can pinpoint that period of time that their breasts were really full and they noticed that their milk was coming in. Um, Okay, here we are. So for when we're, if you're in the opportunity option to be a screening for risk post delivery, then um, these are some red flags. You know, if they did not experience breast changes during pregnancy and they have had breast surgery injury or bi biopsy, um, particularly um, augmentation for asymmetry is going to be a red flag. And then um, if there was a reduction that there was um, a lumpectomy or biopsy in association with that, these are things to be paying particularly close attention to. And then, um, you know, we walked through this, but for mull tips, um, the same, you know, basic question we want to ask everyone is about breast changes. And then with their past babies, did their milk come in and when? Um, and then, of course, if they did breastfeed, um, you know, were they able to meet their goals? Did they run into problems? Um, and, um, you know, someone who's skilled in lactation can make a fairly quick assessment about whether those are primary or secondary type of supply problems if they had them. But, you um, the, those are all good information, good opportunities to collect information. Um, so screening for a risk of, of delayed milk production. If you're working with somebody before they had their baby, before they gave birth, um, asking around about insulin resistance. So, you know, the shortcut to that is did they have a diagnosis of gestational diabetes, DM2? Had they been told they had prediabetes? Um, do they have PCOS? Sometimes I say, have you ever had anyone, you know, I, have you ever had issues with blood sugar um, if they didn't have a formal diagnosis? Um, and then um, mode of delivery, um, babies who are born by cesarean section, um, milk tends to come in a little later. And then is the mother well, you know, like assessing her, is she, you know, with were there a lot of complications um, in her pregnancy? Um, is she, you know, having a ton of swelling, things like that? Issues with blood um, pressure are all going to be um, part of that kind of wellness assessment in general. And then um, for mull tips, asking that about like in your previous pregnancies, did your milk come in? Um, you know, in a timely manner, because as Dr. Fairley pointed out, that's going to happen for pretty much everyone, um, whether they were breastfeeding or not. When you're screening after birth, um, of course, the questions about insulin resistance, um, you know, considering things like how much blood loss, um, gestational age of the baby, what the mode of delivery, and then particularly in terms of mental, the maternal state of health, choreo, any sort of ICU admission, did they need a DNC? Um, you know, was there complications um, of those types? And then um, for mull tips, if they engorge in the first week postpartum, um, since then, have there been any changes in their health history? Did they have a breast reduction since then? Had they have a lumpectomy or um, what biopsy injury pregnancy? surgery? Right. Was this the first pregnancy with gestational diabetes? Um, oh, right. A pretty important interval change. So th this all gets, it gets a bit redundant. And we understand that anybody want to go and develop like a scoring tool or some type of quick screening mm -hmm. tool for people to use, that'd be great. Let's work on validating something. Um, but yeah, and also there's some soft evidence with like every decade of life that you get some increasing insulin resistance. So anecdotally, I've seen moms who had very sufficient supply at 25 who do not at 40, although still quite healthy, no diagnoses and a relatively easy pregnancy. I don't think that's ever easy at 40, but you know, <laughs> the grain of salt. With maternal illness, I think people look at this often and think to themselves that choreo, ICU admission, DNC, like, you know, well, sure, yeah, of course that would cause problems. You'd be surprised the discharge summaries I see that just tell moms to breastfeed ad lib on demand. And then, you know, we've got the added trauma for this poor mom who did get pretty sick of a skinny starved baby that we then have to manage. 
So, you know, related, you know, leading on from that, you know, protecting infant safety um, is our top priority. So once you've done this screening, what do you do? Um, an important, um, in, you know, kind of strategy is to offer expert interventions early in the hospital admission rather than, um, you know, I talked to a lot of hospitals ask like, you know, when, how do you triage or how do you um, sort out who's seeing the IBCLC in what order, uh, assuming you have an IBCLC or sufficient IBCLC um, time, and it, it's often based on discharge, and it might be worth considering kind of reevaluating how you um, distribute or how you um, handle those resources. Um, if you have screened and somebody is at higher risk than another person, then maybe they should be seeing getting that expert intervention earlier on, getting that feeding assessment earlier on in the hospital admission rather than waiting until they're being discharged. Um, and then, of course, the warm handoff to outpatient care providers as part of should be a critical part of discharge planning. Um, knowing who what resources there are for outpatient lactation care in your community um, and making a clear handoff to the community pediatrician who's going to be caring for that baby in the first you know weeks and months um, is an important um, strategy to take that information you gathered in the screening and putting it to use. Um, so, I think you know, me here. I was going to say, I think we're we're back to I me and we're going to have to pick up the pace a little bit. Yeah. Um, not surprising with both Claire and I talking. So the infant safety piece, we if a baby screens in as having a risk factor, if a dyad screens in as having a risk factor, we need to really check infant weight and assess it a little bit more than what we typically do by looking at percent weight loss using the new tool. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, preferably at 24 hours. Again, at 48 hours is still in-house and or pre-discharge. Some my C-sections, at least in my group, stay till 72 hours pretty routinely. If they are a red flag patient, if this dyad's been flagged as having some significant red, you know, some significant possible issues, we supplement from day of life one and we do not wait for weight to drop. If somebody has, somebody's had zero changes throughout pregnancy with their breast, had an, you know, an augmentation because of pretty impressive symmetry, we go ahead and feed the baby physiologic volume starting at day of life one. And so this is some guidance that I think most of us in lactation feel are are pretty physiologic and reasonable um, for a term otherwise well infants is a caveat. Next slide. Newt, this is one of my favorite things. And honestly, Georgia AAP has a has a really fun standalone video. I always think this is going to be a short portion of a talk. And when we did a standalone video for it, it actually took 45 minutes. So I'm going to try and rip through this because this is a nomogram like Billy tool. It's real data. It's 160,000 kids in Northern California, Kaiser. It's pretty fantastic and helps you determine if weight loss or recovery is within normal limits. And it's stratified by mode of delivery because C-section kids do lose more weight. I think most of us know this, but in my, in my time in lactation 18 years, I found that people are really permissive now and say things like, oh, it's a C-section kid. And I'm like, this kid is like bright orange and clearly dehydrated. Um, so we can't just use that guidance. We're scientists, people. Let's go. Next slide. Let's do some things. So this is what the interface looks like. The actual website is newbornweight.org. You need your mode of delivery. You click, of course, their breast milk feeding. Um, and then you put in your birth date, your birth weight. If you do the first three to four days, you do need times. Um, it's also particularly useful for outpatient pediatricians to use in the first 30 days of life. And there it's not an hourly nomogram. It's actually a daily nomogram. Next slide. So, right. So like I said, and I usually add this slide in just for the people who have it on low volume. <laughs> um, like I usually watch live webinars in the office and get interrupted by my nurse. Miracle that it didn't happen today. Um, so this is the website. This is what the acronym stands for. Um, and like I said, it's around 160,000 babies, maybe a little less. And I, I use this to underscore that this is used in children 36 weeks or more, and it's been 36 weeks or more. So if you're wondering if this applies to your late preterm frog, yes, they're 36 weeks. Um, and then so this nomogram, you know, kind of sorts itself out. I think very similar to Billy Tool, a lot of times nurses will call me with a Billy and say, oh, it's the 95th percentile. And I'm like, meh, we've got a problem. So 
what we have is that 90th and 95th percentile are problematic pathologic, 75th is concerning, and 50th is just fine. We can go through and kind of explain next slide. So here's um, my standard case patient that I used to explain new C-section baby. He's got about 9% weight loss at 72 hours of life, getting checked out of the hospital after the C-section. And I think a lot of people would see something even greater than 8% is what I see in a lot of care plans in hospitals and would be concerned about weight loss. And if you look on this graph, it's actually really close to the green. That's the 50th percentile. This is not that far off the norm. You probably want to make sure they've had some teaching, especially of Prima Para, but this is not that far off the typical weight loss and recovery that's expected for a C-section baby. Next slide. As a practical matter, when explaining this to colleagues who maybe didn't attend this talk, or especially to parents, the stoplight analogy works really, really well and often helps you kind of explain guidance and what you're doing. So green is good, green is great. It's just like a stoplight, go ahead, keep on doing what you're doing, things are working well. Yellow, we want you to slow down, look at risk factors, make sure that the latch is good, get some expert help, consider some supplementation potentially, depending on infant and what you think might be the issue after screening and talking with floor staff. And then red and orange are a hard stop. You change your, you change your feeding plan completely to, to, for infant safety and also to protect milk supply because that child is not transferring anything out of the breast. And you do this person no, no benefit in terms of their lactation success to keep them on. Next slide. Yes, you play. Now mute, Claire. Claire, you're on mute. I don't know how I um, how I muted. Let me go back to where we were. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, so when we see um, the when we are when we a little algorithm um, for re regarding expert intervention. So when we have red flags or we know we need um, more support, um, as I mentioned, making these um, dyads a higher priority for an earlier lactation consult. Um, if supplementation is indicated, then um, you know making time time it takes time for um appropriate teaching at the bedside um this is somewhat controversial but um a lot of us are kind of on the same page that alternative feeding methods like syringe spoon feeding cup feeding finger feeding um are are reasonable when we're talking about small volumes in the first few days but um if it's clear that um, supplementation is going to be more than a very short-term intervention than teaching paste bottle feeding um, is important. Uh, I like this picture with the like, you know, none, don't use the fast flow nipple, whatever color that is for you, where you purchase nipples. You want to use a slow flow nipple and you can have videos if, you know, things that will help with the time, uh, time, that it takes to do this teaching. But um, I find that parents are very receptive, especially um, prime of about um, bottle feeding. You know, the vast majority of United infants in the United States are bottle fed at some point. So teaching pace bottle feeding is, is a worthwhile endeavor. And then um, teaching hand expression, um, especially prior to lactogenesis too, and offering teaching and education and access to a breast pump early. So um, we're gonna make sure you all have more information on paste bottle feeding, but you'll see here one of the hallmarks is the bottle is more horizontal and the baby is more upright um, rather than the baby laying on their back and doing uh, what I like to call frat party funneling of, um, of the supplement, whatever we're supplementing with. And then, um, you know, making sure that everyone um, knows you don't keep your knowledge on teaching hand expression to, to your lactation consultants. All your bedside nurses should know how to teach hand expression. 
um, have demonstrated competency in teaching hand expression. Hand expression is a critical skill really for any lactating mother. You may not have batteries, you may not have power, you may not have your pump with you. Um, your baby might get sick and admitted to the hospital and you're full and you need to remove milk. Hand expression is a, a real important skill to be teaching. It's particularly important for low supply moms who Good. often do not see much at all when pumping, but can actually extract a good bit more colostrum. Um, yeah, so colostrum, you, especially um, hand expression, because it relies on that like physical like um, compression of the breast tissue rather than just applying suction to the nipple. Um, it, it's about manually, literally manually removing um, the colostrum or, you know, for folks that have really low milk supply, rem manually removing those smaller volumes. And for some mothers, colostrum is rather thick and sticky, not mm -hmm. always, um, but um, hand expression is a lot more effective and it can produce a lot more confidence in mothers than hooking them up to a breast pump and then being like, don't worry, it's okay, you didn't really get anything, we're putting in orders or whatever, when we actually do need some colostrum. Yes. <laughs> so, and, um, in. and pre delivery, you know, if you're not doing anything with your hands anyway. We have no contraindication to contractions, and delivery is imminent and not going to be stopped. Meh. Teach them then, you pre delivery folks, in all your spare time, I'm sure. Right. Uh, you're waiting yeah. around for the induction to kick in. That's a great time to teach hand expression. Why not? Um, and I usually facilitate this type of discussion with prospective parents with a QR code. So this doesn't necessarily have to be the full hands-on demonstration. We're sensitive to staffing issues, but it's something to consider. Yeah, and a lot of uh, hospitals are putting QR codes to the First Droplets website, um, mm -hmm. which is um, uh, Jane Morton's videos, um, really designed a beautiful website. So check it out, firstdroplets.com. Um, so the warm handoff, which is really one of our big takeaways we want um, for you guys to consider is, you know, what's included in the discharge summary about um, what you have assessed and making sure that appointments are made in a timely manner. So if the newt is above 75th percentile, there um, will need to have very explicit feeding instructions around um, frequency and volume um, and getting that um, follow-up visit within 24 hours, if at all possible. Um, and then they may need, um, as Dr. Fairley mentioned, um, higher volumes or more consistent supplementation um, if they're already been supplementing or if um, we've got a lot of those red flags. And then um, starting supplementing, you know, not literally at discharge, um, if possible, if they're um, based on the newt, um, you know, and whether we're doing that in addition to breastfeeding um, as in after, or if we're supplementing first and then just working on breastfeeding um, as a kind of secondary factor. And then those, for those, both these scenarios, we need to talk through how to protect milk supply, ensuring that the mother has a breast pump to use at home. Um, you know, if she's supplementing first and we're, we're pumping to kind of help move things along, then she's going to probably need more than a manual breast pump. And if she's separated from her baby, she's being discharged without her baby, she certainly needs something more than a manual breast pump. And then, of course, you know, community, community lactation support, knowing what those resources are in your community um, and being able to make that warm handoff there you know, it can be more than just giving people a list. You know, you can make specific outreach to folks. Um, and if if you need support with that, you can check zipmilk.org or contact me um, and I can help connect you with um, community lactation support. And I don't think it needs to be said, but if you have an option for an IBCLC in your community, these diets need to be referred to an IBCLC or a breastfeeding medicine provider. They already have proven that there's concerns that there's issues on hand. Yeah, Separate. appropriate. Yeah, appropriate referral is important. And we have an epic on that as well called the cocoon, the, cocoon, the, the cocoon dyad. dyad. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so check About that out. different. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, we can we can I think we uh, can post the list for the webinar. Yeah, for sure. Oh. And Kimberly will I can make sure Kim, Kimberly includes those in um get that information to Kimberly so she can include it in the um in the post webinar 
uh, communications. Um, I think we'll have to skip these two. Yeah, I was going to say, well, um, just as a follow, you know, latch score, there are ways to assess um, fairly objectively a feeding um, rather, you know, and, and especially if there's indication that there can be issue, the feeding does need to be assessed by someone who's trained rather than just saying like, hey, mom, how was feeding? Good. Click good on a drop down menu. Um, so the latch score is just one of these. Um, and I guess maybe that's we're wrapping up because it's 258. Um, I did want to um, give you all a heads up that next month's webinar oh. is on donor milk. Um, and Dr. Allison Rose will be presenting that. And then I'll hand it back to Kimberly um, here. I'll get out of sharing my screen. Um, and we'll, we're minutes. available for questions if anyone needs to hang around and ask. That was great, Dr. Fairley and Claire. Thank you so much. Are there any questions? We do have a little bit of time. And of course, you can always email questions to me and that I can make sure I get along um, to Claire and Dr. Fairley for some answers if you think of them later. I'm just scrolling up back through the chat to see. Oh, yeah. Thank you to Dr. Patel for putting the link to Dr. Mark's presentation on MPINC. We did have really worse, actually, participation in MPINC this time around. It's every two years, and we only had 50 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm taking every opportunity I can to communicate how important participation and accurate participation in the MPINC is in terms of helping us identify um, areas of opportunity. And we're happy to help. Um, in the course of this initiative, if desired, help folks develop care plans, screening tools, whatnot, kind of based on these assessments. We don't want to assume what people want to chart and how they want to chart these things. Um, but somebody needs to know this information and hand it off. Thanks. Um, a couple of dates here um, to know the January audit will go out on January 23rd to com be completed during that week. And um, we've asked the SMART aims uh, be sent to us. You can send them to me. Um, you'll see my email address there, Kimberly.Ross. Um, if you send that by January 24th, 20, excuse me, 24th, um, and our neonatal committee has been reviewing those and providing feedback to teams um, um, as they are submitted. So um, please submit those. We're happy to review them and provide feedback and also provide feedback on um, as you start working on your key driver diagrams. Um, those um, um, aren't due for um, another month or so, but be thinking of those as you're working through your SMART aim as well. Um, and that is everything from us. If there are no final questions, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you all for being here. We will send all of these great resources that were shared. We'll make sure those are in the follow-up email um, and this will all be posted on Teams and the recording will be on the website as well. So thank you, have a great afternoon.